I'm Linda, and I make the really colorful, uh, kind of fantastical work. Um, this, can, can you all hear me okay? Okay. Um, so I'll start here, uh, just because this is kind of the body of work that I've been working with for quite a while now, which are these here, these objects that kind of almost look like, um, like dusters, uh, like those microfiber dusters you'd find at like Home Depot. I had one hung on my wall for a couple years um, just because I really loved the texture. Um, and so one day uh, I had decided that I was going to try to remake that as uh, kind of almost a, like a microscopic view of a piece of dust. I wanted it to represent dust. And so um, I, I originally made it out of uh, those clown balloons, those really long balloons that they make into like animals for kids or swords. Um, so I filled each one with sand, dipped it in latex paint, uh, adhered it to like a foam form. And I was like, this is great. Until one day uh, I left one with a friend and the friend was like, every once in a while I hear like a little crack and then and all the sand is like drizzling out because latex is an archival, which is kind of in a way kind of works with what I'm thinking about in a sense that I'm kind of trying to create like animate objects. Um, so I had decided that I wanted to try to make them out of clay. Uh, so the dust furry to me um, is kind of this representation of uh, how to see inanimate things as animate and the lives that they live. Um, so my whole uh, vision through these objects is to kind of understand the world around us through abstraction um, and how can you change your perception of everything around you. Uh, so a lot of these things are kind of um, inspired by things that are around us every day, um, such as a piece of dust. And I, all the pieces of dust have kind of detritus on them. Um, so such as um, like rocks, these ones have rocks. Um, some of them have like fingernail clippings. Um, let's see, lint, peas, like little green peas, because I have a small child who loves peas. Um, and I, we find them all over the floor. Um, but, you know, thinking about, um, you know, kind of bringing tiny little bits of the everyday um, into kind of this abstract world. Uh, so for me, when I think about how I got to this place um, of kind of viewing the world in this lens of abstraction, uh, I start to think about like my childhood. My mom is from Vietnam and my father's from Mexico. Um, and so English and language was uh, very, um, we used a lot of kind of like broken English in our household. So my mom would often say things like, Linda, don't put toilet pa too much toilet paper in the toilet or the toilet will choke. And to me, I totally, I was like, yeah, I get it. You know, it's gonna clog. She didn't have the word clog to, in English to use. So her language allowed me to perceive the entire world around me as almost animate in a way. Um, so I would like feed little pieces of carpet in our, in our hallway, like little pieces of paper. Um, so everything and not just toys, but everything around me was alive, which then made me think later on, um, you know, I got this vintage chair from a thrift store and I started to ask like, what, uh, what life did you live? You know, what other lives have you lived? And, and you're gonna continue to keep going after I have my time with you. Um, so I started to have empathy for all of the things around me. Um, so I started to create vignettes with all of these objects and they're kind of like characters in this little world that I create. So I have the furry, the nubby, uh, the, I call this the plant, um, the more furries and this is a mop and there's a couple other characters that aren't here. Um, and so I often kind of put those into um, small vignettes that kind of create interaction between them. Oh yeah. oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, so the, the, that is kind of uh, the objects, uh, the singular objects here on this pedestal uh, and this mosaic here or tiling is kind of coming off of what's happening over there. Um, trying to think if I can spin off of this anymore before I walk over there. Uh, I will, I, when I start to think about the relationships between objects, so not just the relationship that I have with objects, but the relationships between objects is something I'm also really interested in. Um, so the dust furry started because I started to think about how dust, um, how dust feels about the objects that it lives on and vice versa. How do the objects feel about the dust? So do objects 
see dust as like a blanket or a shield to the world, or does the um, or is it a nuisance or a sign of uncleanliness? And you know, is the dust um, does it feel like it's home when it's on a, a, a certain object? Um, so for me, I feel like there's a lot of beauty in it, dust because it is detritus and 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 a, a sign of a, a bunch of different lives kind of accumulation and this something that we think is the sign of uncleanliness, but it's actually like a time capsule of a moment. Um, so I'll walk over here. So um, during the pandemic, um, I made my first lamp um, at a, in a show called uh, essential goods that uh, the curator had asked that we all make something that we felt was a necessity um, for the shutdown. Um, and to me, uh, a lamp was kind of this signifier of being able to turn on the day and turn off the day. And it felt like I was working through the night, um, you know, as uh, I teach at the University of Arkansas with Matthew, um, we have, we had a kid in preschool. Um, so just trying to be able to keep up, it felt like this idea of like, uh, being able to turn off and turn on. Uh, so that has kind of led me into this body of work where I decided to take these tiny ceramic tiles that are each individually hand cut. Um, and they are, the geometric shapes are taken from, um, Mexican textiles and the organic shapes are taken from Vietnamese textiles um, and they're all hand cut and they're kind of just puzzled together to create the surface. Um, I had been working with some weavers in Mexico on some other textiles for other projects. So the language of these uh, geometric shapes was very familiar because they call them constellations. Uh, so I was able to take that language and kind of apply it to the surface. To me, this entire show, which was called Long Lost, um, was a full installation with um, a couple other lamps. Uh, and they're kind of like lamp stools, so you're, you, know, you can actually like sit on them. Um, but for me, they were kind of this idea of like, the whole room was painted blue, and I wanted this place of contemplation and also a place to kind of um, sit and kind of reflect on your own kind of family histories and past. Um, because my mother's from Vietnam and my father's from Mexico, most of their families live in those, still in those countries. I don't have a lot of like my own personal history. So to me, I feel like it's a constant puzzle and there's a lot of gaps. So putting this together kind of um, is, you know, what the surface is kind of representing. Um, so each one uh, kind of represents a different moment. So for this, this one's called Night Songs and it was built for my mom and I to sit on because she used to sing me um, songs of Vietnamese when I was a kid. Um, this one's called Truths because sometimes I feel like they're not telling me the truth when I ask about our family history. <laughs> I'm like, is that real? Like, um, so yeah, so, and then kind of this uh, blue kind of um, carpet and then I had the wall paint, walls painted blue for the full installation and this idea of kind of like where I feel like I don't have a grounding or a foundation of kind of like this cultural identity that should have been passed down to me. Um, so yeah, that's, that's this. So all of them are hand cut and because the form is not flat, we had to make kind of these like slump molds. So um, we would take, they're each porcelain and they're individually um, pigmented. Um, so, or not individually, but the batch of color is pigmented. Uh, so we would take, we'd roll out a slab, cut the forms out and then lay them on the slumps so that we could have curved parts. Um, but then it just becomes a giant puzzle and I like love puzzles. So this is like my favorite thing to do. Um, but yeah, so basically we're just sitting there with the pile of color and then trying to figure out which ones fit appropriately for the space. Sometimes there's like some breaking that we have to do. I think we did the entire show. And when I say we, um, I have a team, I had a project, uh, group that helped me and then I have a full-time assistant. Um, so I think it took us. I think it, we worked on it for maybe eight months for a series of five. Matthew? <laughs> sure, yeah. Yeah, I can talk a little bit. Um, Matthew, uh, thanks for having us. Thanks for being here. Um, my work is the uh, work that is colorless, mostly. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's funny, like, uh, there's some little hints of color here. That's like the first color that's been in my work for about a decade, it seems like, right? So uh, most of my work is, is pretty dark in tone. Um, 
So I'll talk a little bit about kind of the broad strokes of my practice, what I'm doing, and then I can talk about the specific pieces that we have here. Um, for me, I've always worked, um, or for a long time, have worked from other contemporary artists really particularly. Um, so my practice is about this kind of mediation between the personal and between the influence of other contemporary artists, right? So um, I think a lot about the way that we digest the visual world, um, how we are kind of faced with this flood of imagery that we're always looking at. If you think about the way that we interact with Instagram or any other social media platform, the way that we kind of take on information as artists, as creatives, is in this really kind of fast moving wash, right? Um, so for me, I always felt like as an artist, there are, there's a lot of different strategies that you can use. Like what Linda does, I think, is very intrinsic to her, right? It's about her and her upbringing. For me, I've tried to kind of push that aside in an effort to play with the kind of basic um, parameters under which any artist might face in order to produce things that are original, that are kind of worthy of contemplation by an audience, right? So uh, in a sense, it is art about art. Um, it is art that is directly taken from other artists. Um, and this work is from a kind of lineage of work for me um, that started with literal remaking of other people's work. So if I would have an exhibition, I would make, <laughs> I would make uh, models, I would make uh, approximations of things that I was seeing um, that were as much as possible close to the time in which I was making the work. So I don't like to reach back into history uh, for my appropriations. Uh, but I would remake all these things and kind of put them in the gallery space. And you'd end up with this exhibition that was all produced by me, but that would look like a group exhibition. And I really love that idea that like I could kind of dissolve and disappear as a maker, right? And that was like 10, almost 15 years ago now that I was kind of like working through that. And over time, as I've made more and more and more work, I've been more comfortable with the idea that like I don't have to bring that much from the other artist, that I can bring a little bit more of my own history of making, a little bit more of my own preferences and materials, uh, that I can bring a little bit more of myself, whatever myself means, and that's the big question, what is me uh, in all of this? Um, I could start to bring that to the work. So I still work from this place where I'm actively looking at other artists' work, but I allow that distance between what I'm taking and what's eventually produced to be a little bit wider. Right? So if we look at these works that are behind you really, really quickly. Um, so these works are titles for other artists' exhibitions. Um, so none of the text is mine. Basically what I do is, uh, as always, as I'm always looking at contemporary art, as I find a title that I thought was interesting, I kind of write it down and I had a list of kind of hundreds of titles. Um, and I thought like, well, what is the thing, what can you do with exhibition titles, right? So if you've ever had to title an exhibition or title an artwork, it's a hard thing to do. It's this thing for most artists that kind of gets like put on top. It's it's this other bit of information that seems absolutely critical, but it seems really detached, right, from like the whole endeavor. Um, and for me, I thought like, how do I take that thing, which has no physical form, which is really important to these exhibitions, and how do I give that formless thing an actual physical form, right? So it's about sort of making an object of the non-object portion of another artist's work. Right, so it's like bringing that into concrete being, if that makes sense. Of course, there's like a lot of selection, then there's like all of the extended craft that happens, like to make these things is a pretty big endeavor. Um, in the case of these, um, you know, this work is over the last probably 18 months I've been working on this. Um, so very much like post-pandemic, very much like trying to find something in there that feels right for this moment, that feels right for this moment in art. There's a kind of documentary aspect to what I do. Um, but you know, process-wise, um, these are 
like I said, I'm, I'm taking those titles uh, and then I hand draw them really simply. Uh, and then I basically put those into Rhino, 3D model them, CNC route them. Uh, and then there's a whole process of mold making. And then each of these you'll see has a kind of like texture on them as well. So there's a kind of folding of this kind of handmade texture uh, into the, the kind of mold making process as well. So it's not this like machine cut thing or it isn't like literally taking the text that I've found online and just like printing it. It's not that at all, right? Like every step of this takes a lot of labor, a lot of thought, a lot of handwork, a lot of like, like I said, bringing this thing into objectness uh, in a way that I think is quite different than if you were just to say print images uh, of these titles. Um, so that's this work. Like even though this is not a group show, we spend so much time talking about titles and like, what makes sense, what works, you know, and there's this kind of gut feeling about things. Um, you know, in this case, because it's the two of us, um, I mean, I think we were trying to find something at some level that sums up the way that our practices intersect or the way that they are distanced from, from one another. Um, yeah, and ultimately, I think we found the title on one of our daughter's sweatshirts. So there you go, that simple, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, she has a yeah, live from the moon sweatshirt. So um, yeah, and you know, I, I feel like it feels a little funny to say that out loud, but I think that that's the truth of how all of these things ever come together um, for, for almost anybody who's got to like bring meaning into the world in this way. Like we reach and we grasp and we pick and we find and um, yeah, and I think that's like ultimately what we're both doing. Like Linda's looking at her personal life, her the domestic space, the things immediately around her. Uh, and then I'm looking at, yeah, contemporary art in this way, you know? So it's this kind of like continual picking for things. Um, but yeah, that's how we got to the title. And, and I think for us, it just, yeah, sums up this idea of like closeness and distance simultaneously. Like, you know, we, <clears throat> I mean, we're obviously married, we have a child, we live together, our studio is in the same space, we work together, our, our offices at school are right next door to one another. I mean, sort of everything about our lives is really intertwined, but the practices are completely different, right? Um, and we're involved in each other's practices. They're, we are close to one another's practices. I mean, I think we, um, yeah, I mean, Linda is the first person I always ask for, okay, is this working? What can I do? What do you think about this? You know, what? Yeah, and uh, yeah, so, you know, live from the moon, it seems like this, this, this thing that speaks about distance, but also closeness and immediacy and kind of transmission, right? if that makes sense. You know, generally speaking, I think that we're, like, I'm looking at artists that are, like right at that spot where their work is pretty propositional. Like I said, I'm not looking at art history, and then I'm not looking at artists who are, I mean, oftentimes they're really well established, but I like this kind of uh, tier of artist where it's like at the high-end gallery, or that you might see it in sort of a high-end art publication. Things that I'm kind of like skeptical of that you look at and you go like, I'm not sure about that. Like my instinct is to question it and to be skeptical of it. Um, which is to say, like at some level, the work that I look at a lot of times is on the quite conceptual end of things, which then leads to, I think, an understanding from other artists that the, the, that the endeavor here is also quite conceptual, right? And that like remaking, like I don't get into licensing issues. I don't get into, you know, there's no like legal problem with what I'm doing. It's all transformational. Um, and you know, the initial early works that I made were really close reproductions. Um, but here, I think there's generally, this may be a little different because it's really specific, it's language. Um, but generally speaking, the work I make, you could take it and you could say like, is this this artist or this artist or this artist? And it could be all of those or none of them. <laughs> it could be somebody else entirely. Um, but I think there's so, like, so much overlap that the idea that anybody kind of can pinpoint a thing, usually that kind of dissolves, you know? So, so I don't run into any issues, but I am, I haven't heard anything from this yet. It hasn't been out maybe 
uh, around and around enough, but I wonder about these pieces because they're so, well, they are the language that I've taken, you know? Um, but like I said, there's a whole other endeavor in there that, you know, uh, it's being repurposed. So, so, but yeah, the short answer is I haven't had a problem. I mean, there's all of these like kernels of ideas that you kind of track over time, right? And in all honesty, um, like I probably, actually I know, I was looking at Ricky Albenda's work, who's a painter who paints words, you know what I mean? And I was like, that's really interesting, right? And, um, you know, he does it in this way that's like, they're all these like meticulously, like it would be like chrysanthemum, and he just paints chrysanthemum on a canvas and it's, they're, they're lovely, they're really, really, really wonderful. Um, you know, it's a type of work that I'm drawn to, um, and yeah, just kind of wanted to give it a go. Um, and then I think also there's this thing of just like looking at exhibitions all the time and going like, what can I exploit here? Like my endeavor very much is like, I mean, all honesty, it's like, you know, like when you look for years and years and years at like this, like everything that I look at is just opportunity. Like it doesn't, it's like, what can I do with that? What kernel can I grab? And those titles just keep flowing, flowing past over and over and over again. So like at some point you go like, well, I'm gonna grab that part instead of that part. And then where do you go with that, you know? So like I said, every endeavor is a little bit different. Um, so this work, I, Linda and I were in Rome in May and June this year. Um, and I found myself at the last minute with a residency at a little ceramic center. Um, when we were going to Rome, so Linda was gonna be, Linda taught a class in Rome. Um, on mosaic, um, and I figured I was just going to be taking care of Una and like hanging around, doing the tourist thing, like taking it easy, uh, and I ended up with a residency instead. And so I had like zero plan. There wasn't, and I'm a planner. I'm a person who goes in with like a a very clear idea of what my strategy is going to be. Like I want to know the and the arc of the project before I start the project. In this case, I I didn't have any intention of making work in the usual tools, my studio, the kind of mold making processes that I do, these processes take a really long time. And I knew that I had a four week residency, which meant that the normal processes that I would use, I didn't have available. Um, and in this project, what I decided to do was like, stay a little bit closer to working intuitively and then as I found any moment where I was stalling in the making, that then I would turn to other artists, right? So basically, uh, anything to get me started. Um, and in this case, like, you know, basically I looked at some like Richard Tuttle's work and, uh, and kind of started in with a little bit of material play. Um, and then I, yeah, just one thing would kind of build off of, the, off of the next. And if I got to a point where I wasn't sure what to do, I'd literally just like get on my phone or my iPad in the studio, go on like Contemporary Art Daily or Art Viewer and just like scroll through the photos until I could go like, okay, uh, that's the next move. You know what I mean? And then I take that idea and then sit back down at my table and fold that move into the making. And the idea was like, how can I do this quickly? You know, we had a lot going on. We knew it was a short, or a short amount of time. You know, so the pieces kind of build off of one another, but then they also kind of trace my exploration of these other, these other contemporary artists as I was viewing them at the time. Um, and, you know, so they're bits and parts. They're fragments. They're little ideas. They're inconsequential. They are... Um, <laughs> Yeah, it felt like no pressure uh, in a way. I, I had no intent of showing this work here. Um, two months ago, I didn't have this work and I didn't assume that I would. So um, <laughs> I made it uh, and I felt like it was worthy and it was interesting and I feel like it holds up an end of my practice that's kind of as open as I can be as an artist but still is tied to this bigger project of, of like I said, mediating the, 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 the kind of relationship between what's mine and what's 
other artists, if that makes sense. So, you know, we both teach in Fayetteville at the University of Arkansas. I don't know if, if any of you know what's been going on at the University of Arkansas. Like, you know, basically like six, eight years ago, we got a ton of money um, from the Waltons, like a huge amount of money. Um, I think in total at this point, like $190 million. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, we've been there 10, 11 years. Um, so we saw that gift given, and then just this past January, we moved into a whole new studio building. But in those years in between, you know, we built an art school. Um, you know, we went from 15 faculty to 65 faculty. We went, you know what I mean? Like, it, we went from, personally, in like the ceramics area, we went from 7,000 square feet to 20,000 square feet. You know, like, you know, there's a lot to be done at work, um, and that has an effect on your work. So, you know, it's a little bit different than saying, like, you know, the teaching that I do, the ideas that are going back and forth between the students and ourselves, I feel like the work is a little, like, that hasn't changed my practice necessarily, but the availability of time, like, what I'm thinking about most days, you know, it's not always in the studio. So like, it's like with this piece, you know, it's like, okay, I've got four weeks. I'm just gonna like make some things, you know, or with that work over there, like I know it's gonna be this project. This is what I'm gonna do this year because I don't have, I don't have hours, you know, mm -hmm. um, so. So yeah, you know, I think that's the way it's affected me, but I don't, I don't know about you. Yeah, I, I mean, I started off at a different point at the university. So I started off as an instructor, so I didn't have the service load as demanding as Matthew as running a program. Um, so for me, I thought my time was like ticking at, at the institution, you know? So I'm like, I better build a career like fast because I don't know if I'm gonna have a job tomorrow. <laughs> so for me, it like really created this like hustle to like, make, 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 get in shows, do, you know. Um, so for me, I, I felt like it really just kind of like put a fire under me to like, one, like I love teaching. I love being able to work with students. They bring so much energy and they keep like, they keep me on my toes essentially, which is great. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, uh, I was able to use the resources at the university. Like we, our kiln is, not huge at home at our home studio so like i wouldn't be able to make you know large scale ceramic objects um, so teaching comes with those advantages um, i ended up with a tenure track tenure track i'm tenured now a tenured position and um as matthew was saying like there's i actually do have to think about my practice every day because i have a full-time studio assistant and i have to have a full-time studio assistant because i can't do both i mean it's multiple jobs essentially so yeah um but i think like you know for me like working for the university has really allowed me to kind of actually like make work that i would never be able to do in my home studio um it just has allowed like a really tremendous amount of resources and also like accessibility to um all the artists and curators that come through the university um yeah, I, I'd have to say it actually feels like it has really helped me. Yeah. Mm -hmm.